Hi, Steven Sashin here, and in this video, you're going to learn how to pick a good running shoe. And the information that we're going to be talking about comes from, in large part, this article, which is from the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, it's also coming from experience that I have, so I'll be adding my editorial, but most of this is coming from the ACSM and their recommendations. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to read some of this and then throw in my editorial. Running shoes should be selected after careful consideration. With so many brands and styles of shoes on the market today, it is important to find the best fit for your feet and needs. There is no right shoe that fits all runners. However, research and injury patterns have shown there are some general characteristics of a good, safe running shoe. Now, before I even jump in, I just want to warn you that what you're about to learn flies completely in the face of what you will hear from most people trying to sell you running shoes. You go to your average running shoe store, they will tell you the exact opposite of what you're about to hear. Remember, this is research coming from the American College of Sports Medicine, not someone who has been paid to say certain things from a running shoe company, for example. Now, someone are gonna argue, they're gonna argue because I actually own a shoe company, Trust me, you'll hear the difference between what I'm saying and what someone who's being paid to say things that are the opposite of what the American College of Sports Medicine is saying. So here we go. Let's just start with this first paragraph because this really, if you get nothing out of this other than what's in this first paragraph, this could change your life. A running shoe should protect the feet against injury, but should not do the work of the foot by providing excessive cushioning and lots of extra support in the arch. A shoe should complement a strong foot. Okay, let's just parse that. Let's break that down. A running shoe should protect the feet against injury. Okay, that's the fundamental function. If you look at running shoes prior to 1972, most of them really thin bits of leather and some leather on the top, but that's all they were doing was protecting the foot against injury. They weren't providing any of the bells and whistles that you see in modern running shoes. So something to keep in mind that this whole new running shoe thing really kicked off in the early 70s and has changed dramatically. And what the ACSM is suggesting right here, first thing, protect the foot against injury, primary function. Okay, so next, but shouldn't do the work of the foot by providing excessive cushioning. Now what that means, the work of the foot and actually the entire lower body, its job is to be a natural spring and shock absorber. So you don't want the shoe to try and take over that role, and we'll talk about why in a little bit, but suffice it to say, you want to let the foot and the rest of your lower body do its job by providing excessive cushioning. Now the reason you don't want excessive cushioning is uh, Harvard's Daniel Lieberman showed this, your foot has more nerve endings in the sole than anywhere but your fingertips in your lips and your lips. And one of the things that that uh, sensory feedback mechanism gives you, it tells your brain how to use your whole body. It tells your brain what you're stepping on or in. And so if you have a bunch of cushioning, your brain basically tells your foot to land harder because it's not getting information otherwise. So it's a paradoxical thing, paradoxical until you think about it really, that you don't want excessive cushioning because that actually has been shown to increase loading forces in the body. Uh, another reason that it increases loading forces is with a lot of cushioning, you'll often land with your leg fully outstretched straight leg, which means you're sending a uh, force right up through the joints rather than using the muscles, ligaments, and tendons as the natural spring and shock absorbers they're built to be. Okay, so you don't want excessive cushioning and you don't want lots of extra support in the arch. I'm going to argue you don't need any, but let's just start with you don't need extra support in the arch. Now, some people will go, but I need support because I'm wearing my orthotics and blah, etc. Okay, if you look at some research done about orthotics and support, a, uh, this is some, uh, there was a great article in the New York Times written by one of my favorite science writers because she's A, brilliant, and B, I love her name, which is Gina Collada, looking at arch support, and basically it showed that it's primarily not necessary. Very few people are helped a little bit for a little bit of time, but if you wear support over time, it can actually be detrimental. Think of it this way. You break your arm, you put your arm in a cast, it's being supported, and when it comes out of the cast, it is weaker. Same thing happens with your foot. If you don't let your foot move naturally by supporting it, it over time gets weaker, and that's a vicious cycle. So you don't need extra support. A shoe should complement a strong foot. Now you might say, do I have a strong foot? Well, the answer is if you've been wearing padded big shoes with a lot of excess cushioning, doing way more than just protecting your foot against injury with a lot of support, you may not. So how do you get stronger? Same way you would if you had if you come out of the cast, you start using that arm, it gets stronger. You use your foot, it gets stronger. You can use your foot when you have a shoe that does what it's suggesting here, not uh, just protecting yourself against injury, not doing the work of your foot by providing excessive cushioning, not giving you a lot of extra arch support. If you've been in um, highly supportive shoes, it can take you a little while to get those things working again, but anyone can get stronger at any age. So just FYI. Okay, let's go down a little further. 
Characteristics of a good, safe running shoe include minimal heel to toe drop. The drop is the difference in thickness of the heel cushion to the thickness in the forefoot cushion area. Or another way of saying that, just the difference in height between your heel and your forefoot when you're standing on the ground in the shoe. Let me show you an example of something. Yep, there we go. So here's a, a shoe where I've drawn these two lines. Here's basically a straight line parallel to the ground. Here's the line you can see from the heel to the ball of the foot. It actually goes a little further, but same idea. And this distance here is the drop. In this case, this looks like about a half an inch which is significant. This is practically wearing, well, it's not practically wearing high heels. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a high heeled product. I mean, that is a significant amount to elevate your heel. Let's back up. Uh, where'd I go? Oops, here we go. Um, shoes with no drop, right here. Shoes with no drop or a small drop, six millimeters or less, are the best choice for allowing the foot to normally support loading during each gait cycle. So the gist of it is, the way your foot works, your foot has an arch, and an arch works when both ends are kind of touching the ground properly. When you jack one end up, an arch falls down. Same thing in your foot. When you unnaturally move your uh, heel up, um, it just changes the whole biomechanics of your foot and makes it so you don't load your foot properly. It also can offset your knees, your hip, and your back and cause your butt to stick out and cause other problems as well. Um, but so first things first, you want to go with a shoe with a no drop or a small drop. I'm going to use as an example for no drop, a shoe that I just pulled off my foot. This is one of mine, I will confess. So zero, zero shoes have a zero drop. So the height of the um, the uh, ball of the foot is the same as the height of the heel because it's a flat sole. Okay, so let's look at something else though before we jump off on that. Um, let's look at a shoe like this one. So this is a Hoka shoe and this is kind of deceptive because your heel sits in this cushion here. Um, so this is actually, I'm going to draw this line if I do it correctly from the ball of the foot Oops, well, that's supposed to be a straight line. Yeah, it is. There we go. It's a straight line. So technically, this is a zero drop shoe, but look at all of that cushioning. And that is like an inch and a half of cushioning. And let's go back to this first line right here. Um, should not do the work of the foot. Here we go. By providing excessive cushioning. I'm just saying. That seems like excessive cushioning. In fact, if you take a look at research from Irene Davis from Harvard, she investigated shoes like that and found that they do not, in fact, reduce the force going through your body uh, with all that extra padding. In fact, often as I described, because your brain wants to get feedback, can sometimes and often increase forces. So um, there's something that's actually not described in here about shoe shape that I want to bring up, and that's a thing called toe spring. That's this angle here. Toe spring is designed because these soles are stiff. And with a stiff sole, as you're moving your foot, if it was a stiff, flat sole, you would just be slapping the ground and your foot wouldn't be able to move naturally. So this toe spring was built in to kind of let your foot rock forward as you come off the ground. But the problem is your toes are like this all the time and that's not natural. So you can see that it looks like there's some toe spring in the zero shoe, but that's actually A, just the shape that the shoe has taken over time because I've used it, and B, it naturally flattens out when you just put any pressure in it. Tiny bit of pressure totally flattens out. So that's the difference. Uh, and toe spring, again, not something you want. That's something that's not mentioned in this article. Okay, next. Characteristic of a shoe, neutral. Means the shoe doesn't contain motion control or stability components. These extra components interfere with normal foot motion during weight bearing. I want to tell you how this whole thing of motion control and stability came to be. So in 19, early 1970s, when Nike started making higher heeled shoes, when you have a higher heeled shoe, when you put padding under the heel, you tend to use that padding. It's just one of these things your brain does, even though it's not great for you. You use that padding, and so you're landing on your heel. Now your heel, oh, I don't have it. I normally have a foot skeleton around me, but your heel bone is essentially a ball. Have you ever tried to sit on one of those stability balls? It's not stable. Neither is your heel when you're landing on your heel. So suddenly you're able to land on your heel, but now you're unstable. So now we have to build in motion control because we're, you're unstable. Holy smokes. We haven't, um, it, it, I don't know if it talks about the arch thing later, but there's another thing that the reason that they started building in arch support is when you land on your heel, your foot gets fully extended by the time it comes down. So that arch you have in your foot gets primarily flattened out and that puts extra strain like, I mean, look at it like, you know, this is kind of strong but relaxed. That's strained. So that strain is in the plantar fascia, the un parts underneath your foot. Um, so when you land on your heel, you're unstable and you land and your plantar fascia are fully extended. They're in a weak position when they're trying to contract. Think of it like your bicep. 
Your bicep is weaker here, stronger here. Same thing with your foot. It's weaker here, stronger here. So land on your heel, it adds all that extra force, uh, it makes you unstable, and it puts your plantar fascia in a bad position. Otherwise, it's awesome. Now, some of you might say, but wait, but wait, I need pronation control. Okay, hold that thought. Uh, here we go. Let me just look at this part right here. Be aware that all runners pronate or drop the foot inward. Pronation is a normal foot motion during walking and running. Pronation alone should not be a reason to select a running shoe. Runners may be told why shopping, that because pronation is occurring, a shoe with arch support is best. And, and not just arch support, they'll like post this part of the shoe to keep you try to keep you from pronating. Uh, what is it? Uh, in fact, the opposite may be true. Pronation should occur. It's a natural shock absorber. Stopping pronation with materials in the shoes may actually cause foot or knee problems to develop. Excessive pronation can occur, and I'll say something about that, but in most cases it can be corrected with therapy and exercises to strengthen the foot, leg, and hip rather than buy a shoe. Uh, ben O'Nig did a great bit of research on this showing how um, your foot wants to just move naturally and if you add pronation control it actually can cause your muscles to overwork in ways that they're not designed to. And I, don't, I know other people have researched this as well, but this idea that you need pronation control, you look, if you pronate, or if someone told you you pronate, I'm betting the person who told you was either a doctor who was about to prescribe an orthotic for you or a shoe salesman who was about to prescribe a more expensive shoe with a bunch of pronation control. Again, all the research is pretty clear. Pronation is not a problem. It's a made-up condition like, um, oh, just think of all the drugs that were made up to cure problems that didn't exist until they had a drug to cure it. It's the same kind of thing here, something to keep in mind. And let me show you another thing. Wait, was this about, the, about pronation control? Um, oh, uh, it says uh, excessive pronation. Where did it say that? It says something about pronation. Um, Where'd it go? It says, oh, excessive pronation can occur, uh, but in most cases it can be corrected. Let me talk about one thing that can cause excessive pronation. Let's take a look at this. So look at how flared this sole is. Look at how far out the, here, I'm going to draw this again. So here's the flare of the sole. Here's the flare in the heel of the sole. So what this means is that flared part, and your heel is actually right about, going to rest right about here. So what this means is that when you're wearing this shoe and you're typically going to land sort of on, slightly on the outside edge of your foot normally, you're going to hit way further out than the actual, actual outside edge of your foot. And because these soles are typically stiff along this curve, this is going to flatten out my curve drawing in a second. Oh, it didn't. Good. What that means is you're going to hit this edge and it's going to make your foot slam to the ground faster. It's going to pronate faster. So that's hyperpronation, which can send a vibration all the way up your leg and that can be problematic. So ironically, the shoe with stability control can often be causing the problem. In fact, if you put this, this extra density stuff right here, that's designed to control the pronation that's being caused by this edge of the shoe over here. So it slams you down but then they're trying to protect it and keep it from moving. It's, and all of that is because if you land on your heel, you're on an unstable surface. But again, this is in the forefoot, this line over here. This, this uh, uh, heel flares in the forefoot uh, and midfoot. So if you land, or like, let me find another image like this one. Here you can see the amount of flared out space of the heel. Oops. I had to do that. Anyway, I'll do it this way. You can see that how far out the sole goes compared to where your foot goes. So that edge is hitting first, which causes your foot to hyperpronate, to pronate too quickly. That can be problematic. Okay. Uh, let's just take a look at a few things. Over oh, this is, I love this. Where, where can you look for running shoe? Check in with a local running club and ask the leadership there where their members commonly purchase shoes or where merchants have a knowledgeable staff who have expertise with running shoes. Good luck, because most of the people who are going to be trying to sell you shoes have learned all of these things from shoe companies about why, for example, let's go back here, why, for example, you need all this padding, why, for example, you need all this heel lift, why you need this toe spring, why you need this flare, why you need all of this motion control and support. Most of the people that you're going to be meeting at a running shoe store, most stores, will be telling you again the exact opposite of everything that's in here in the, AC in the ACSM report. So finding a knowledgeable staff is going to be really challenging. You bring this pa pa paper to them and they will argue with you about how you're wrong. They don't have research to back it up. They just learned it from shoe company guys who are selling them their, um, their padding, their motion control, their stability, their support. 
Okay, so here's some how to buy a running shoe. Every time you shop, have your feet sized at the store. It's amazing. Your, um, your left and right foot may be a different size, of course. Your feet will change shape over time. If you start using your feet, if you start engaging that arch, you can find that your, sh your foot gets shorter because your, pull your foot is being naturally pulled up by the stronger muscle ligaments and tendons that are now in your body. So you definitely want to measure repeatedly. Don't be married to a size. Shoe sizes are different between different um, brands. Sometimes even within a brand, one product might fit one way and another product might fit a different way. So just find what fits. Don't worry about the size thing. Foot shape, foot shape or arch height are not good indicators of what kind of running shoe to buy. In other words, just because you think you have a flat foot or a high arch, that doesn't tell you what to buy. There's no correlation between having a flat foot or a high arch and a specific shoe. Keep that in mind. Um, avoid buying shoes based on advice giving after someone in the store has watched you walk. Uh, your foot gait and your gait and foot motion are very different when you walk and run. Very, very true. But equally true, if someone puts you on a treadmill, just because they're watching how you move at 50, 60 frames a second doesn't mean that that's giving you information about what's appropriate for a shoe. Let's just go back. Shoe shouldn't do the work of um, the foot by providing excessive cushioning and lots of extra support in the arch. Looking at, a tre at someone running on a treadmill can be very useful. Looking at 60 frames a second or even fewer frames a second is not necessarily giving you the information that you need. I mean, as an example, I had some testing done by the former head of biomechanics uh, for the, and, sport, and, and, and engineering for the U.S. Olympic Committee, and he filmed me at 500 frames a second. And in the last two frames, um, as my fo right foot was coming to the ground, it was rotating outward slightly before it touched down. There was some tightness in my hamstring that was making that happen. But you would never see that at 60 frames a second or at 16 frames a second, which is most video, or 24 or 48, or even 200 frames a second. You wouldn't have seen that. But more importantly, someone's going to look at you on video. How do you know they're looking? They know what to look for. They're good at looking, and they're going to take whatever they see and turn that into an appropriate recommendation. Most of the people who are looking at a treadmill learned how to, or looking at you on a treadmill, have learned how to evaluate that information from a shoe company telling them, here's what you look for, and then here's what shoe you put them in. Mostly it's going to be shoes that violate all these things coming right back to the top. So be careful about that. In fact, all runners protate, pronate. Yes, that's true. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, buy running shoes at the end of the day when your feet have swollen as much as they will and the shoes won't feel as tight. Great idea. Your feet definitely do change size and shape based on temperature, based on use, based on it, whether you've just done a big run or not. So keep that in mind. Be sure the shoe has a wide toe box. Now, did I mention before? I don't even remember. My favorite thing about this article is that all the recommendations are not these shoes. The shoes at the top of this article, none of them are what the ACSM is recommending in this article. Even though these look really wide, that's only because those soles flare out kind of like, um, let's go back and see, kind of like this one. So if you look at this from the bottom, it can look pretty wide, but from the top, it's relatively narrow. And so keep in mind, so none of these shoes actually are what they're about to recommend uh, with a wide toe box. Be sure the shoe has a wide toe box. The toe box is the area where your forefoot and toes are. You should be able to wiggle your toes easily. Narrow toe boxes don't permit the, permit the normal splay or spread of the foot bones during running. This will prevent your feet from being able to safely distribute forces during the loading phase of the gait. Let's go back and take a look at some of these. Excuse me, not only is this narrow, let's draw my line, not only is that narrow, but um, is this the shape of your foot? No, your feet are not pointy like that. Your big toe does not come in at that angle. Your little toes, they may do a little, a lot of things. There's different foot shapes. Um, I'm going to delete that. Let's see if I can delete that and delete this one. There's different foot shapes. Some people, their toes go almost straight across. Some people, their toes kind of curve like this. Some people have a higher second toe, a longer second toe than their first toe, although technically it's that their first toe is shorter than it should be, not that their second toe is longer. That's the condition I have. It's called Morton's toe. Some people, the curve, the the or the the angle between their big toe and their uh, little toe. I've seen things that look like this. Lots of different foot shapes, but n I've never seen anyone whose foot was shaped like this, unless they spent a whole lot of time in shoes shaped like this. So what's a variation? Take a look. Here we are again. So just notice a nice and wide, shaped more like a human foot, and it's not flared out. What you're seeing on the top 
is the same as what you're seeing on the bottom. So this is designed to let your feet splay, you'll let your toes splay and spread out. Now, will this fit, will like a zero shoe, will this fit every human being? No, there's different foot widths as well. If there's someone, if you're like a four a quad E, um, this shoe is not going to be wide enough. And the reason that people don't make shoes for people with, you know, really, really out there feet is because there's just not that many people like that. And it's expensive to make these. We would love to make shoes that fit all human beings. We're not a big enough company yet to do that. So on we go. Now, this is one that's interesting. Here, let's go to this. There should be at least a half an inch of room between the toes and the front of the shoe, about enough spa pl space to place your thumb between your big toe and the front of the shoe. I disagree. And here's why they make this recommendation, though. It's a great recommendation if you're buying one of these regular shoes, okay? And the reason why is because of all this foam between the outsole and your foot. Think about taking a phone book and bending it. When you bend it, the outside doesn't bend a whole lot. The inside is bent a whole lot. The inside effectively gets shorter than the outside. It's the same thing in a running shoe with a lot of foam on the inside, or a lot of foam here. When it bends, the inside becomes effectively shorter than the outside. And so you need that extra space because as you're moving through the gate, that, that shoe will effectively get shorter and your toes can jam up on uh, up into the front and you can knock off your toenails and do all sorts of crazy things. With a shoe like this one from Zero Shoes, there's no midsole, there's no giant chunk of foam, so when it bends, it doesn't have that same phone book effect. So we know people who are sometimes wearing a smaller size in zero shoes than they do in other shoes because they're not having to get that extra space to protect themselves from what happens with all that extra foam. So keep that in mind. With regular shoes, totally need the space. With something like zero shoes, without all that foam, you might not. Uh, let's see, what else? Test the shoe to determine, here we are. Test the shoe to determine if it's too narrow. Take out the insert of the shoes and step on them on the, step on them on the ground. Does your foot hang over the side of the insert? If so, the shoe is too narrow. Again, totally true for a shoe like this, uh, but not necessarily true for one of ours. Just because the way this is made, uh, it's so low to the ground that if your foot extends out further, it's not gonna, it's not causing an, a problem. You're gonna be, you know, standing on the the material that's designed to actually handle a wider foot. So we've seen people who who they seem to. Uh, extend over the, let's see if I can show it that way, they can extend over the sole, but the shoe is designed to handle that, so it's not actually a problem. So again, for normal shoes, I totally recommend with this. Um, not necessarily true for something like ours. This is a really interesting one. When you test a running, the running shoe, um, be sure that the heel doesn't slip. Okay, so I was at a, a American Trail Running Association conference where people were asking, how do I prevent heel slipping? What makes the heel slip, let's go back here, it's a similar thing, is the stiffness of this sole. So as your foot is trying to bend, if the sole doesn't bend as much as your foot, your heel can slip out. And people do a whole lot of crazy things to try to hold your heel in place when the shoe doesn't match. But if you take something like Zero Shoes, um, these can bend as much as your foot. <laughs> in fact, even more than your foot. So heel slipping isn't really a problem with these. But we also have this um, sandal, Warache sandal inspired lacing system that does hold your heel in place more than shoes that don't have anything like that. This is functional, it's not just decorative. You can actually tighten this up. So A, this will bend so, it doesn't, so your heel stays in and you can also lock in your heel a little more with that uh, heel strap. Okay, some shoe qualities to avoid. High, thick cushioning. We talked about this before. Soft cushioning may actually encourage runners to adopt worse biomechanics and land with greater impact than shoes with less cushioning. I would just take out the word may. <laughs> it seems to. Uh, shoes that have a high heel cushion and a low forefoot cushion. Again, that high heel toe drop, um, that's really problematic. But again, this one has no drop, but tons and tons of cushioning, so keep that in mind. Um, extra arch support or insert, extra arch support inserts or store-based orthotics, they're often not necessary. They should be considered a temporary fix until foot strength is increased. A therapist can help you with exercises to strengthen your foot, so you don't need arch support on a daily basis. Think about that one. Again, if you've been keeping something weak, if you've been keeping it in the cast, then it's, then all you need to do is get it stronger. You don't need to keep supporting it. I, um, uh, I saw a company that makes an insole, and they they had a, an ad. I won't mention their name. They had an ad. It was a drawing of a foot in profile, and then a drawing of a barefoot with their sole underneath it, and it said 37% less stress 
instantly. And I asked them, I said, were you measuring stress by measuring muscle activation by using an EMG, an electromyograph? And they said, yeah, we were. I said, so what you're saying is when I step on your insole, my muscles are working 37% less. So I've just become almost 40% weaker just by standing on your insole. Wouldn't it make more sense if I was trying to get rid of stress by putting my foot in a cast so I would have 100% less stress? <laughs> and they, they didn't know how to respond to that. So uh, you, wanna, you don't wanna just keep your foot supported immobile because over time it just weak, gets weaker, weaker, weaker. You can strengthen your foot at any time just by starting to use them naturally. And that's of course what I recommend and it's what the American College of Sports, Sports Medicine recommends as well. Okay, we're coming into the closing stretch here. Transitioning from an old shoe to a new shoe. Be aware when you change from one shoe to another, there should be a transition period where you need to wear the new shoes for part of a run. Over a couple of weeks, the time wearing the new shoe can increase till the entire run is performed with the new shoe. Um, there's an idea that if you're gonna to go to something that's you know really flat, a zero drop shoe, that you're supposed to use transition shoes just to go lower, 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 lower till you get to something like that. That was made up by companies that sell transition shoes or sell things that are you know 10 mil, six mil drop shoes and don't sell something that's a zero drop shoe. So that's propaganda. And what you wanna do instead is what they're suggesting here. Just start with a little bit of time, build up the amount of time. It's like going to the gym after your arm comes out of the cast. You don't go to the gym immediately and just do six hours of bicep curls. You do a little bit with a little bit of weight and over time you add weight, you add reps, you add more intensity. Same thing when you're switching to a shoe like what the ACSM is describing or any shoe really, but especially what they're describing. Exercises to increase foot and hip strength should be done before and as you transition to the new shoe. When initially exercising in shoes with a minimal drop, the lower extremities will need to adapt by activating the muscles in the hip and gluteal buttock area. There may be some initial soreness in these areas for the first couple weeks. Listen to what that's saying. This one's an amazing thing because what it's saying is when you use a shoe like this, you are you are potentially using the muscles in your hips and glutes that you weren't using when you were in a shoe with a big heavy drop and a whole bunch of cushioning. So uh, just something to think about that you're actually using the muscles called the prime movers in your body when you let your feet and bot and legs move naturally. It's kind of obvious. If you let your body do what it's designed to do, it'll do what it's designed to do. And the way your hip and butt are designed to work is with a natural gait, with a natural style, not with a big elevated padded thing. Uh, if you're switching from a shoe with a high, here we go, hold on. Oh, there we go. If you're switching from a shoe with a high heel to toe drop to a shoe with a low drop, consider using a transition shoe with a moderate heel drop for the first part and then switch. I have not seen that that's useful. This again, one of the places I'll disagree. Um, I've seen, we've had thousands of people just switch into these and be totally fine. Now, back to the soreness thing. Sometimes people will say, if you switch to a shoe that has no drop, you'll get Achilles tendonitis, your Achilles will get sore, your calves will get sore totally optional. Uh, there's some videos that I have at zeroshoes.com that talk about that. Basically, if you're getting calf soreness, it's because you're doing one of two things. You're either landing on your toes and decelerating, which puts strain on your calf, or you're pushing off too much with your calf, um, which puts strain on your calf. Neither of those are necessary. If you land with your foot under your body, you can land with sort of a midfoot landing or a flat-footed landing. So you're not trying to decelerate too much with your calves. <clears throat> Excuse me. And rather than pushing off, you wanna think about lifting off by like, imagine lifting your knees by flexing your hip rather than pushing your knees off the ground by pushing with your toes. So that will reduce um, soreness also again, starting slow. Just like it said before, just build up the amount of time you're, you're doing this over time and uh, you won't have that problem. Here's another one that's really interesting. When should you buy new running shoes? General rule of thumb, purchase new shoes for every 350 miles, but limited science has not identified the ideal time frame for all running shoes. Different shoes will vary in wear based on what materials they're made from, whether the shoes are used for more than running. Uh, faster wear may occur if the shoes are used for other activities. So let's back up and talk about why there's that recommendation of three to 500 miles. So first, all of this foam. This foam compresses over time. Now, Phil Maffetone, who's a brilliant uh, running coach, especially long distance running, uh, he, he used to recommend just getting the simplest shoe you could, or what he loves to say is, if you get a shoe with foam in it, usually it only gets good once the foam is fully compressed when they're telling you to replace it. Once the foam is compressed and it becomes more like a zero drop thing without a big elevated heel, without all that, that excessive cushioning. So A, they're recommending that because the foam that they're trying to sell you as being valuable has decomposed or has compressed out by that time. Um, and B, look at how thin the rubber is here. So it, it just so happens that by the time that uh, foam compresses, this rubber is probably wearing out. 
what a shock. Uh, so <laughs> I'm getting punchy at this point. Just as a comparison, this is about five and a half millimeters of solid rubber. It's a feel, we call it feel true rubber. We developed it specifically to give you protection, but also give you ground feedback so your brain can feel what's happening with those things at the end of your legs and tell your whole body how to move correctly. Our soles have a 5,000 mile warranty. When we designed these soles with a rubber manufacturer, or we designed the rubber with a rubber manufacturer, he said, but that's not what running shoe companies do. And we said, yeah, we know. So, um, so keep in mind that that advice about 350 miles plus or minus is based on the construction of that shoe. And that's, I would argue it, it may be planned obsolescence. I don't have any proof of that. Seems potentially likely, but some of it is just, again, the materials. Regardless of how much planning you do, there's no foam that's gonna just stand up forever. It compresses, compresses, compresses over time. If there are any wear patterns on the shoes that reveal the sole layers underneath, discard the shoes. Uneven wear can cause changes in running mechanics that lead to injury. Now, the wear pattern is going to be interesting because it's going to tell you what you're doing. And so the reality is what you're seeing in the wear pattern is going to talk to you about, frankly, how the shoe is probably altering your gait so that you're applying more force than is necessary in those places that are wearing heavily. Maybe because you're scraping your foot on the ground or landing again by, by basically applying braking forces or you're landing with that flared heel that can do the um, put abrasion on the outside of your heel. If you're getting and if you're pronating, I mean, all those things can be telling you more about the shoe than about you. And if you go back to what the ACSM is recommending, something that's just giving you protection without excessive padding, without excessive support, you're gonna find that, um, that in that case, the wear patterns may actually be more informative about what's happening with your form in a way that you might wanna pay attention to, to reduce that. So when we say that the soles have a 5,000 mile sole warranty, it doesn't mean they're guaranteed to last that long. It means that we'll replace them if they don't, bar, or pending what we have at uh, zeroshoes.com slash warranty. But if they don't last very long, that's gonna be pointing to some form issues that you may wanna address, you may wanna correct by, and you'll, you'll be getting that feedback, you'll be getting it's not a Rorschach test, it's just a, uh, you'll be getting a map of what your body is doing that you can use to become a better runner. Holy smokes. That is way, way more than I uh, had any intention of saying. I don't know how long this video has gone, but certainly longer than I expected. But more importantly, I hope this helps you understand the reality behind running shoes compared to the mythology of running shoes, which is what most people are telling you when they're, they're trying to sell you shoes. Again, I'm, uh, it's unabashed that I'm, I'm hoping that you try out a pair of, this is our Zero Shoes Prio. Uh, I'm hoping you try our stuff out because it does almost everything that the ACSM is suggesting. The only thing it didn't, what, was, what didn't it say? Oh, half an inch of room, that's not about the shoes, that's just about fit. Pretty much, every, yeah, not too narrow. Oh, the, um, whether the insole is you know wider than your foot or not. But almost everything they recommend, no, not almost, everything they recommend is what this shoe does. So of course, I hope you get it. But not because I'm trying to convince you of anything, because I'm hoping that you see that what the American College of Sports Medicine says and what we're doing are completely consistent. And that makes you interested in trying something like the Zero Shoes Prio or any of our other shoes or sandals. I hope this was useful. I can't wait to hear what you think. I hope you stuck with me this long. Um, more importantly, you know, the most important thing about finding a good running shoe is so you can go out and have fun. You can enjoy yourself. Um, and I hope you do that regardless of what shoe you buy. As we say at Zero Shoes though, just uh, feel the freedom, feel the fun, feel the world, live life feet first.